Welcome to Forest Hills Church. My name is Pastor Andrew, uh, our senior pastor. Pastor David is out of town with his family, uh, so we are here uh, carrying on without him. So welcome. We are a church that loves God. We seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve to the best of our abilities. That's what we're all about, making disciples here at Forest Hills. So welcome to this place. If you are joining us at home online, we welcome you here just as much, and we just pray that... God's presence and grace uh, work through our technology, however he does that. So, today uh, we are continuing in our uh, Frequently Asked Questions series, and so as we uh, move into that, I wanted to share with you our memory verse uh, from Hebrews 4.12. I'm going to ask us just to read that together out loud. God's word is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to judge the heart's thoughts and intentions. Hebrews 4, 12. Well, that's a nice catchy one for us this week. Um, so, as we get started in our uh, service this morning, I just want to get us started in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, would you please stand as we continue in our worship? Thanks, Pastor Andrew. Um, I'm Amanda Lucas. Obviously, I'm not Andrew because Andrew's back there, so we've got him on drums this week. And hello again to everybody who is joining us remotely. We miss you. Um, but we are we're going to jump right into worship. So if you're at home, stand. Get ready to do a little clapping. Those of you who are here in person, just follow our lead. Clap as you feel led. Move as you feel led.
words from the scripture, 1 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. Jesus will keep you strong until the end, so that there will be no wrong in you on the day of our Lord Jesus comes again. God, who has called you to share everything with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Thank you, God. even when we stumble and fall in the race. We pray your, pray your blessing on today and all of those gathered here and those at home watching. And just pray for your wider church in the world and for Forest Hills Church. In your holy and precious name, amen.
usually uh, you move it to our generational bridge time, where you try to speak a word to the kids. A lot of times we have them come on up, but I think today uh, I'll have you guys stay in your seats. Um, and the, we've been asking questions about the Bible. And today's question is, how old is the Bible? We have the Old Testament, which we're talking about today in today's service. We have the New Testament, and there's a lot of years in between them. And so how old is the Bible? Well, we would say that Moses first wrote the first five books of the Bible. Uh, he probably wrote them at least 3,400 years ago. Now, that's a long time. And most kids, you know, most kids think 100 is a huge number. 3,400 years ago, compared to the New Testament, John, the, the Apostle John finished the book of Revelation. Uh, he finished that about 2,000 years ago. All right, so we have this huge span of the Bible, and, the, and I wanted to show a couple pictures uh, on the screen here so we can think about how old things are. So I'm going to show you a picture of something, and I want you to guess how old it is. All right, this is an ancient globe etched on an ostrich egg that archaeologists found. How old do you think? 9,000. All right, let's see. 500. 510 years old. Okay. Let's keep going here. You can kind of see this is a coin, and on the coin is the head of a lion. You can see his mouth open with his teeth. What do you think? How old? How old? All right, 2,000, I heard someone say 2,000 here, 2,700 years old, okay? So this coin is older than, part, than our New Testament, right? All right, let's see, what does that look like? <laughs> bathrooms, right? Yesterday. Now the, these bathrooms had running water underneath them, okay? So this is pretty good technology, how long ago, let's see? 2,000 years ago, okay? So about, you know, we would say roughly the time of Jesus. When Jesus lived, they had, um, the Roman Empire had bathrooms with running water. That's kind of cool. All right, let's see another one. We've got a couple more pictures here. Now these are old socks. And these socks you would wear with your sandals because they're from Egypt. So let's see how old these are. 1,500 years, okay? All right, let's see, we've got a few more pictures. Now what does that look like? Mask, right? These were, these were the, the first sunglasses. Before they had lenses or before they had tinted lenses, they had these little squinty masks. And these are how old? 800 years old, all right? So let's see. Okay, a few more. This is called a Model T. So let's see how old this one is. 104 years old. All right. Think about that. How far our cars have come in 100 years. And one more. Just threw that in. So let's see. Eight weeks. Two months old. So he's a little bit new on the stage, right? But we want to remember now. The Bible fits into history. All those historical things we saw that actually existed, the Bible is one of those things. It's an ancient document that goes back 3,400 years when Moses, when Moses wrote his section. So the, it's important to remember that the Bible is a part of history and that it tells the story of God's people. Um, and just like our memory verse today, our memory verse says... God's Word is alive and active. Even though it's old, 3,400 3, years old, it's still alive and active for us today. All right? We thank God for that. We thank God that His Word is true, that His Word is something that uh, has existed for a long time and has a history to it. Um, now, I want to move into our prayer time. And as I mentioned, today, today's sermon, we're talking about the Old Testament. Um, and as we've seen, actually, let's look at our memory verse again. No, if you could just pop that back up. Um, the memory verse from Hebrews 4.12. I 
want to look at that together as we jump into our prayer time. There we go. Thank you. Uh, let's read it one more time. God's word is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to judge the heart's thoughts and intentions. Hebrews 4, 12. The heart's and intentions, okay? It's able to judge the heart's intentions, which really means that the Bible can get to the heart of the matter, right? It kind of cuts through all the, all the noise. So in your pew Bibles, you should have a blue Bible in your pew. I want you to turn to page uh, 1,138. 1138, and this is going to lead us to Habakkuk. Chapter 3, Habakkuk 3, and Habakkuk was a prophet of God, and he himself, he worked right up until the end of the time when Judah was overtaken by the Babylonians, okay? So if we're talking about time frames, this was 607 BC when Judah was overtaken, and Habakkuk himself had a bone to pick with God. He wanted to know why God seemed so silent while the bad guys seemed to be winning. Okay, and if you, actually, if you look at the very beginning of Habakkuk, I'm in the wrong book here. At the very beginning, it says, in chapter 1, an oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, and then it says, the prophet complains. Right? He brings a complaint before God. Um, and so... He wants to know why the bad guys seem to win. But we're going to read through chapter 3, which is on 1138. And what does the top of that page say? It says, the Lord's victory. Um, so this is, we're going to read through this chapter. We're going to pray through it because it really is a prayer. It's actually a psalm. Um, and we can tell by the very end of the book that it's meant to be sung with stringed instruments. So this is a song. And a lot of times psalms in the Bible are prayers. So we're going to pray this prayer today, and in this prayer we're going to hear a lot of things we're not used to hearing. Uh, we're not he used to hearing these things about God, because, you know, we we are New Testament people, right? So we sometimes forget the majesty, the power of God, the holiness of God. And so this chapter helps us recover that reality about God, all right? So, um, as we pray through it, I will I will do the odd, verse, odd number verses. And I'll have the congregation read through the even verses. All right? So, pray with me. The, the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to the Shigemah. Lord, I have heard your I see your work. Over time, you've died. Over time, you've made known. Though angry, remember your passion. God comes from Taman, and the Holy One from the mountain of Paran. His majesty covers the heavens, and his praise fills the earth. His radiance is like the sunlight, the rays flashing from his hand, but as the hiding place of God. Pestilence walks in front of him, plague marches at his feet. He stops and measures the earth, he looks and sets out against the nations. Your glory has come to last, the eternal will of I saw the tents of Cushan under duress. The curtains of the land of Midian were quaking. Was the Lord raging against the rivers? The Lord's raging against the rivers. The Lord's You raise up your empty bow, uttering curses for the arrows. With rivers you split open the earth. Sun and moon stand still high above. With the light, your arrows shoot, your spear at the flash of your of lightning. You go out to save your people. For the salvation of your anointed, you smash the head of the house of the wickedness, laying bare the foundation up to the neck. Those who take pleasure in secret, devouring the Lord. 
You make your horses tread on the sea. Turbulent waters foam. Though the fig tree doesn't bloom, and there's no produce on the vine, though the olive crop withers and the fields don't provide food, though the sheep are cut off from the pen, and there are no cattle in the stalls. The Lord God is my strength. He will set my feet like the deer. He will let me walk upon the heights. Father, thank you for these words. Let us not forget, Lord, your power over creation. And let us tremble before you. That our lips would quiver, that our insides would quake, because you are so great and so mighty. And Lord, let us stand as dear on the heights with sure footing, because we trust in you. We trust in you. In your holy name we pray. A little bit longer section of scripture, but it's good for us to uh, to do that once in a while, to digest a little bit more of God's word than, than maybe we normally do. Uh. All right, well today we continue on with our Frequently Asked Questions series. Uh, I think it's good for us to stop and tackle questions head on once in a while. I know, at least for me, I like to think that we know everything. Um, but our faith is inherently mysterious. You know, we are relating to a mysterious God. And we're trying to figure out how we can live our lives faithfully to Him. So that is a process in which questions abound. That's kind of the way it's meant to be. Um, and one of our questions, or our question for today, sounds like a pretty simple one. The question is, do we really need the Old Testament? Do we really need the Old Testament? So I think that many Christians would answer in the affirmative. Yes, of course, we need the, the Old Testament. You know, without it, we wouldn't have the beloved Psalm 23. Or we wouldn't have these, these classic stories of David and Goliath and Jonah and the whale or Noah's Ark. You know, the childhood classics. So, of course, we need the Old Testament. And though I think that, that many Christians would say yes with their mouths, I think that many Christians live lives that would sort of answer differently. Our lives would say, well, no, not really. Right? I have, I have Jesus in the New Testament. I have the church in the New Testament. I have Christmas and Easter. So, uh, I guess I don't really need the Old Testament. And so as a result, I think many people don't bother much at all with the Old Testament. And I understand. It, it can be hard to understand. It's, it's long. It can be boring, you know. Man, do we really even need it? It doesn't help, too, that in our culture, old things get a bad rap. Right? New is always better. And in the world, especially the world of technology, uh, things are outdated by the time they even hit the market. And of course, the, the word new is always followed by another word, right? New and improved, right? And so the New Testament, you know, people have the same attitude toward the Bible, right? If the New Testament is better because, well, Jesus is nice, God is love, and there's no battles, there's no warfare, there's no long list of rules, which maybe could be debated. But the New Testament is improved because it's so much shorter. <laughs> Who needs to spend all their time going through ancient history? No. If the New Testament is better, do we even need the old? So I want to bring us back and remind us of the words of Jesus himself when Jesus says, I have not come to do away with the law and the prophets. Instead, I've come to fulfill them. Right? So Jesus completes the story. Jesus fills in the gaps. But by no means does he negate or dismiss what we do find in the Old Testament. 
So this morning, I stand with Jesus up here today and emphatically state that yes, indeed, as Christians living in modern Western society, we need the Old Testament. So I'm going to expand a bit on that answer. And when I do, I want to focus entirely on Jesus. Okay? Because Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our focal point. Right? He is the Word made flesh. And so from beginning to end, this Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so I want to begin with Jesus, and I want to end with Jesus. All right. Imagine that. <laughs> so to do that, I want to turn to the book of Hebrews, which we've heard a verse from today. And Hebrews is probably the most Old Testament of the New Testament books. Um, it's helpful for us because it was written specifically to Jewish people. Right? And Jewish people knew their Old Testament. They're born and raised learning the Old Testament. And so, we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, starting right at the beginning. I'm going to read through this section, and then we'll kind of comb back through it and pull out different things. The writer of Hebrews says, In the past, God spoke through the prophets to our ancestors in many times and many ways. In these final days, though, He spoke to us through a son. God made His son the heir of everything and created the world through him. Okay? The sun is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. He maintains everything with his powerful message. After he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty, and so the sun became so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than theirs. All right. That's a lot. That's deep. A lot to comb through, but let's look at verse 1 here. It says, In the past, God spoke through prophets. All right? And we know a large chunk of our Old Testament is dedicated to the prophets, the words that they spoke. Um, and often, these words were words of judgment and reprimand. Right? The prophets spoke mostly to God's own people. Not always, but mostly. And a lot of times, their words were judgment. And so... That being the case, these sections of Scripture are not always the most fun for us to read. They're a lot easier to skip, right? So I think most of us admit that, yes, these prophets did speak the Word of God, but we also have a difficult time seeing how those words apply to our lives. Right, let's read on in verse 2. It says, In these final days, though, God spoke to us through a son. He spoke to us through the Son. So, something has changed. Right? We've moved on from prophets speaking the Word of God to now the Son speaking the Word of God. But we need to understand and be clear that the words that are spoken, whether they're spoken by Jesus or by Elijah or by Jeremiah or Hosea or whoever, those are still the words of God. Right? Because as Jesus said before, He didn't come to dismiss these words or do away with them, he came to fulfill them. So we would say, Jesus is better than any prophet because he's the son. But his message is still the same as those prophets who went before him. And that message is, repent and believe. Repent, turn from the life you're living, and believe in the words, believe in the message that I'm bringing to you. Um, we're going to look here at Matthew chapter 21, how Jesus himself sort of explains this. And he, of course, does it in the context of a parable. So let's turn to Matthew 21. Again, this is kind of a longer section of Scripture, but I'm going to read through this parable here. Remember, Jesus is speaking these words to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, these were people who were professional Old Testament scholars. They knew their Bible. They taught that Bible. They enforce the rules of that Bible, okay? He says to them, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Okay, this is a legit vineyard. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. He left town. Now, when it was time for harvest, 
he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed his servants. They beat some of them, and some of them they killed. Some of them they stoned to death. So again, he sent other servants, more than the first group. Well, they treated them in the same way. So finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Good logic, right? But the tenant farmers saw the son, and they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him, and we'll have his inheritance. So they grabbed the son, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? Poses this question to the Pharisees, right? And they reply, well, he will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. Jesus says to these professional biblical scholars, he says, haven't you ever read your Bible? Haven't you ever read in the scriptures the quotes from Psalm 118? Haven't you ever read the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it's amazing in our eyes. And Jesus says, therefore I tell you that when God's kingdom will be taken away from you, it will be given to a people who produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person it falls on. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parable, they knew Jesus was talking about them. They were trying to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because the crowds thought that Jesus was a prophet. All right. So Jesus has this long story about how God sends his servants, the prophets, to his people with a message. And his people continually ostracize and persecute and kill his prophets. So God sends his own son, and the son comes, and does that designation garner him any respect or status? No, not in this world. He's treated just the same. But see, we can't understand Jesus as a prophet unless we're familiar with the prophets who came before him. We don't understand the importance of the Son coming unless we know about the servants who have come before Him. So yes, we need the Old Testament. Now Hebrews goes on to tell us some more info about the Son. He is the heir of everything, and God created the world through Him. So He truly is the beginning and the end. Uh, it says He is the light of God's glory, and the imprint of God's being, he maintains everything with his powerful message. And after he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty. So, there's a lot to digest here. And I think probably each of these clauses could have its sermon all, of it, all on its own. But I want to focus on just one. One line. He carried out... The cleansing of people from their sins. Right now, in the New Testament Gospels, we connect some dots and we can see that this occurred when Jesus died on the cross. Right? That's how he saved us. But then that brings up another age-old question. Why? Why did Jesus have to die? How does that make any sense? And that's a great question. And the writer of Hebrews would look at you and say... Haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know what the scriptures say? Because just as Jesus is the greatest of the prophets, he's also the greatest priest. And that's a role that we would know all about, more than we want to know about, from a book like Leviticus. But if we're not acquainted with the wise and the hows of the Old Testament priesthood, well then knowing that Jesus is the priest of all priests, holds little meaning for us. We wouldn't understand how a priest intercedes and comes between humans and God, and how a priest makes atonement for the people's sins. And so we need the Old Testament. So let's keep going here. Hebrews continues. It says, The Son became so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, 
he received a more important title than theirs. And can anyone guess what that title is? King of Kings. King of Kings, which we sang in our, our Lion of Judah song. Lion of Judah makes no sense without the Old Testament. But we, we see that Jesus is the King of Kings. And remember back to verse 2 in our passage, it says that the Son was made heir over everything. So he literally is King of all. King of all. So I think most of us understand kings, right? We know that from childhood fairy tales that kings are rich and powerful. Um, they live in palaces. They're in charge of the army. Uh, they have royal robes and sit on a throne. And they wear a crown. All these things. We, we know about kings in general. But if we neglect the Old Testament, then we do not know very much about this king in particular. Right? That this king was the promised Messiah. And that his reign is woven throughout the entire scripture. We wouldn't know about the long, uh, dramatic, and frustrating history that God has between, uh, the, this history between God and Israel's kings. And so we're left in the dark about the importance of King Jesus unless we acquaint ourselves with this history. So, we need the Old Testament. And that first answer to our question, do we really need the Old Testament? I would say, yes, we really need the Old Testament if you really want to know Jesus. Jesus is our prophet, our priest, and our king. And these are roles that we cannot properly understand without the background. They'd be like, like jumping into the last installment of a book series. If you can imagine that, right? All the characters have been established. All the history has been made. But you're coming in too late to the party. Imagine, if you will, the greatest Tolkien fan. All right. I don't know if you've met any Tolkien fans. There's some over here. This side. <laughs> But these people have immersed themselves in the lore of Middle-earth, right? They know what makes each character tick. They have read and reread every part of the trilogy. They've read the peripheral books that were written by Tolkien. And they not only are big fans of the literature, catch this, they're also big fans of the author, right? They don't, the, the, they, honor, they honor and they love the work itself but they also honor the writer as a man, as a, as a creative person. They honor Tolkien himself. And so if we dismiss the Old Testament, we cut ourselves off from all that backstory. We just won't know as much. We just won't have the same appreciation for the work. And worst of all, worst of all, we're not able to become big fans of the author. Because we're just not familiar enough with what he's written. And so if we really want to know Jesus, we really need the Old Testament. As I was writing this sermon, I was reminded of some of my days in seminary and Bible college. And some of my favorite teachers in that time were my Old Testament professors. And I had to share with you Dr. Sprinkle. He stands out among them. He's kind of a misfit, for sure. I think if you were to line him up uh, in a line of random people, you could probably peg him as an Old Testament professor. He just looks like it. Right? And he was a great teacher because when you heard him speak, you just knew that he simply loved God's Word. He was enamored with it. Right? You, you knew that he, he knew it front to back. That he had, he had parsed it and studied it. That he digested it and absorbed it. And he just loved it. Now, of course, he was concerned with this, its useful application for us today. That's what this book is all about. Biblical law and its relevance. He wanted people to apply God's word to their daily lives. But even beyond what it meant for my life right now, Dr. Sprinkle wanted to get to know the author as best as he could. And so his passion went beyond the text itself. His passion was for Jesus. Now, a few years ago, uh, actually, Pastor Dan Hare introduced us, uh, those who go to Red Rock, to a man named John Oswald. And Dr. O, we call him. Dr. O is our speaker for the week at camp. 
And he's another Old Testament professor, as you probably can tell. And uh, he's another man obsessed with Jesus. And I believe he's obsessed with Jesus because he's so immersed in the Word of God. Uh, this is one of the books he wrote called Be Holy. And uh, he is also you know, concerned with how we apply the Old Testament to our daily lives. But I wanted to, I stole a few thoughts from Dr. O, so I wanted to give him credit and pass along some of these um, ideas about why he feels we need the Old Testament. Um, his answer to the question would be, yes, we need the Old Testament because the New Testament assumes that we know the Old Testament. That's what Jesus is saying when he, when he tells the Pharisees, haven't you read your scriptures? Aren't you familiar with this? The New Testament assumes we know it, that we're familiar with the themes and stories, that we are already standing on the foundation that the Old Testament has built up, that God is not of this world, that he's totally holy, that he's totally set apart, he's totally unique as our creator. And with that foundation in place, then, the New Testament comes along and blows the reader's mind when it talks about Jesus coming into our broken world, right? Our out-of-this-world God has become one of us. The Old Testament teaches us that God is absolutely holy and just, that sin and impurity cannot stand in His presence. And then the New Testament fulfills our understanding of this God by highlighting that God is also love. That wrath has not been removed. There is, judgment is still at hand. But we cannot know and appreciate God's patient love and mercy unless we know all about his holiness. The Old Testament shows us that uh, God works with a specific chosen people. The Israelites, right? The Israelites are condemned or saved together as one people. And then the New Testament comes along with a doctrine about personal salvation through Jesus. That we can know God personally. Right? So again, the New Testament comes along to fulfill our understanding of what the Old Testament teaches us. So yes, we really do need the Old Testament. And so because of that, I want to challenge you, challenge everybody, to read more of it. To read more of God's Word, Old and New Testament. There are un unknown amounts of resources that can help you do this. You know, you can look up anything online. But I wanted to just remove the middleman and give you, uh, right in your bulletin, give you a reading plan that can help you along in this process. This is the, same, the plan that I'm currently using, um, which makes it the best. <laughs> but actually, it is a good one. I've done a couple different reading plans. This was a pretty good one. It takes you through four or five chapters a day. Not too bad. There are some uh, reflection days built into the schedule, so you can take a break. You can catch up on those days. I use those days to catch up when I'm behind. Um, but I, I want to challenge you to just get into God's Word. It doesn't have to be a super difficult thing, but it's something that we need to do as God's people, right? If we are God's people, we need to be people of His Word. We need to be people of His book. We need to know what it says. Certainly, there are tough parts to get through. But I believe that the struggle is worth it. The struggle through these hard parts. You read that verse and you're like, well, how, is that, how is that the God I know? Right? But we don't come to this with a God we know. We let this explain to us who God is. Our understanding of God comes from this, and so we need to read it. It's a shame to, to leave it on the shelf, right? It's a shame to never unlock the life that lies inside of these pages. So I want you to use this chart and just run with it. Let, it. let it help your life somehow. Get into God's Word. Get to know the author. That's the whole point of it. We get to know the author. We get to know Jesus, who is our prophet, priest, and king. Right? And if we're committed to know who Jesus is, then we'll be delighted to grasp every bit of information we can. We will want to know his word, right? The first and the second part. Now, if you can remember back, for those of you who are married or have been married, 
Remember back when you first met your spouse? Those days when you were falling in love? Right? You cherished every note that they wrote to you or every little, I guess these days, every little text message. You wanted to know all about who they were. And as your relationship grew, you got to know their family and their history and their roots, right? You wanted to know all of it, the good memories and even those tough experiences that they've had. You love them. You want to know those things. And all of that information combined allowed you to know the person that you love more fully. And so it's the same thing with Jesus. The, the Old Testament is a revelation of Jesus himself. It's his history, right? It's his roots. And so we wrestle with the hard parts and we, we rejoice in the triumphs, but we carefully read over every word that he's written to us. And we come to understand our Savior more fully when we engage with and allow ourselves to be shaped by the Old Testament. So we really do need it. Amen. Yeah. All right, if you would um, stand with us and join us for our closing song. We're going to dance our way out the doors this, this morning. So again, feel free to become a part of our auxiliary percussion section and clap. <laughs> why we love Lynn. She always remembers <laughs> the things that we drop. <laughs> so as you're leaving, there's a, a box to the right. There's a smaller one to the left that's a little bit harder to put envelopes in there, but um, that's how we're collecting our offering these days. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, Lynn. All right. Parents a little break 
from this sort of quarantine. It's kind of a tough summer for families in a lot of different ways. Um, am I missing anything else? I think that's it. So, I'm going to bless you and dismiss you. you. Ready? May the God of peace bless you as you go. May you be people of his word and may his spirit uphold you in truth until the days of his coming when we get to fly away. Amen.